Acoustic neuroma is neither acoustic nor a neuroma. It actually arises from the vestibular division of the vestibular cochlear nerve. And it is not a neuroma, but it arises from the myelin forming sheath known as the swan cells, which is responsible for formation of the myelin. It's a benign encapsulated, extremely slow growing tumor. It usually originates from the eighth nerve in the internal auditory canal. And as it grows, it expands to involve the other nerves such as 5th, 9th, 10th, 11th nerve and later the brainstem and the cerebellum. It is the most common tumor of the skull base and it is the most common temporal bone neoplasm. And it comprises more than 90% of the CP angle tumor. Sometimes it is associated with neurofibromatosis 2 and in such a situation it comes in earlier in life in third decade rather than the normal fifth to sixth decade of life which uh, uh, the isolated tumor comes and uh, neurofibromatosis 2 has slight female preponderance. Nowadays the, we are detecting tumor much earlier because of the improved investigation such as an MRI so we are able to pick up the tumor at smaller size and where, where the hearing is still better and uh, hearing is still serviceable. So uh, the sporadic cases, they, they are more common and they are usually unilateral and comes in fifth to sixth decade of life. Whereas if they are associated with neurofibromatosis, they present at younger age and usually it can be, it can be bilateral also. Usually the chromosome 22 is associated with the neurofibromatosis, be it sporadic or in association with neurofibromatosis 2. Pathologically, it originates from the superior and inferior vestibular nerve. Usually the ratio is almost same and some book quote that it is more common in superior vestibular nerve. Usually there is a junction called obstinar redlich zone. Uh, it, is, is, it is near the scarpus ganglion and it is usually comes from, the, from there. It can be uh, microscopically Antony A type or B type depending upon the arrangement uh, of the uh, nuclei. It is a very slow growing tumor and then it grows, you know, uh, maybe one millimeter per year. Sometimes uh, it can undergo involution on its own when it outgrows the blood supply or there is decompression of the cystic area. And sometimes the growth rapidly increases if there is cystic degeneration or there is intertumoral bleeding. So the uh, neurofibromatosis uh, altered tumors can occur either in a sporadic form or in hereditary form. Sporadic are more, much more common and they constitute majority of the tumor and are usually unilateral. So in this case, we will be discussing more about the sporadic tumor. The presenting symptoms are usually the cochleovestibular bundle is involved first in the internal artery canal. So there are symptoms of the vestibular nerve, the cochlear nerve and the facial nerve are usually early presenting symptoms. There is a marked difficulty in understanding the speech out of proportion to the PTA. This is a classical for uh, vestibular swanomas. Although they may hear the sound, but the speech discrimination is quite poor. Sometimes they are present with sudden hearing loss as well. As the tumor grows, it will involve the cranial nerve 5, 7, 9, 10, leading to symptoms associated with the involvement of this nerve. Further, as the tumor grows, it will involve the brainstem and the cerebellum also. Usually, the sensory fibers are involved before the motor, uh, motor nerves. That's why the corneal reflex goes early before the masticator muscle are involved. Similarly, even in facial nerve, 
we get Hitzelberger sign, which is the hypostasia of the um, uh, posterior superior part of the EAC and the concord bulb before the modern nerve gets involved. So the sensory fibers are affected first. As discussed, as the tumor grows, it will involve the brainstem and that will lead to ataxia and the upper motor neuron types of paralysis. Cerebellar involvement leads to, you know, you can do the cerebellar function test. And then as the tumor grows intracranially, you will have the signs of raised intracranial pressure. There are also typical signs such as the uh, nystagmus and uh, once um, intracranial pressure increases, it leads to papilledema as well. So, uh, investigation essentially comprises of the audiometric testing, MRI and neurological examination. There is something called rollover phenomena, that is reduction in the speech discrimination score when loudness is increased beyond a particular limit. So, uh, the audiological walk-up includes, diagnostic walk-up includes audiogram where you see asymmetric hearing loss. There is a unilateral hearing loss and if there are other uh, signs of, uh, you know, raised intracranial tension or other nerve involvement, probably you have to suspect the uh, acoustic neuroma. As the brain stem, So a unilateral high frequency hearing loss and the speech discrimination is out of proportion to the audiogram. Although they may hear the sound, they cannot discriminate the speech. That is a classical of retrocochlear pathology such as the acoustic neuroma. So the second thing is the rollover phenomena as already described. The speech discrimination keeps improving as you increase the intensity to a certain level, then there will be actually a decrease rather than increase. That's known as the rollover phenomena. And acoustic reflex delay may be there or sometimes it's absent. So hearing loss is one of the most common presentation of acoustic neuroma. The hearing loss occurs because the tumor compresses the nerve or its blood supply. Even if, it, if there is a vascular occlusion, it leads to hearing loss. ABR is used as an important screening test for acoustic neuroma. There will be increased interpeak interval and there is a uh, sometime interall wave 5 latency difference of more than 20 milliseconds. So, in a resource constraint setting where there is no MRI, the facility of MRI is not there, then ABR can be an important tool for uh, diagnosing, uh, uh, screening for acoustic neuroma. You can suspect the acoustic neuroma and it's quite cost effective. If there is, if when you do ABR, if you suspect there is a acoustic neuroma, then you can send the patient to a higher center where there is MRI facility in order to diagnose the uh, acoustic neuroma. If the hearing is, I mean, uh, less than 30 dB and speech discrimination is better than 70%, it's called good hearing. We call it serviceable hearing if the PTA is less than 50 dB and speech discrimination is at least up to 50%. If the PTA is more than 50 dB and speech discrimination is more than 50, uh, more than 50%, um, then we say non-serviceable hearing loss. Thus, 
PTA of 30 and species discrimination of 70% is very good. PTA of 50 and species discrimination up to 50% is okay, still serviceable. But beyond that is non-serviceable hearing. The gold standard for diagnosis of acoustic neuroma is uh, gadolinium, gadolinium enhanced MRI. In T1 sequence, uh, here we can see um, there is more of cisternal component. And in the second, you see more of the internal auditory canal, canalicular component. If there are areas of cystic changes, then you can see hypointense area. Classically, gadolinium enhanced MRI shows ice cream cone appearance because it has a cisternal component and the intracanalicular component. That gives the appearance of an ice cream cone. In neurofibromatosis type 2 associated uh, acoustic neuromas, they may present as a bilateral acoustic neuroma. These are the differential diagnosis of the acoustic neuroma that can be present at the cerebral pontine angle and with the help of MRI, it is possible to distinguish between them. When there is no MRI, you can also do sometimes CT contrast, but it doesn't pick up the small tumors, but it can help in identification of the bony destruction and expansion of IAC. It can also find the position of sigmoid sinus and emissary vein, which are important if you are planning for a retrosigmoid approach. The size of the tumor, staging of the tumor, is based on the cisternal component and not the intracanalicular component. So intracanalicular, we just keep it as confined to IAC. The cisternal component, that determines the stage of the tumor. Small up to one centimeter, one to two centimeter, medium two to three, moderately large, large three to four centimeter, and giant cell if it is more than four centimeter, cisternal component of the tumor. We are more focused on cisternal component because they increases the uh, intracranial pressure and compress the brain stem. So once tumor is detected, I, either you can do observation with serial MRIs and audiograms, or you can do intervention such as surgery with the treatment of choice, radiation in some cases, and rarely medication. Thus, the treatment options are observation with serial imaging and see the growth of the tumor. You do surgery, which may be translevrentine, retrosigmoid, or middle fossa approach, or stereotactic radiation are the treatment options. So, which option to choose depends upon the size of the tumor, what is the neurological function such as the facial nerve function and the hearing, what is the age of the patient, what is the patient choice, what is the preference, whether it is sporadic or associated with neurofibromatosis type 2. So uh, you do observation because you want to avoid the risk of surgery and the cost associated with the treatment. <coughs> but why do observation in the first place? It's because the rate of growth of tumor are very, very slow. So if they are, you can just do serial MRI, maybe yearly or six monthly, and if they are just growing less than one millimeter per year, you can just do observation. Also, if there is a, the patient is elderly and uh, there are health risks associated with the surgery or the radiation, then we can just do serial MRI and observe them.
if this tumors they grow rapidly more than one millimeter per year then they usually occur within the initial five years of detection so you know whether you need to operate or not if they don't grow rapidly within the initial five years then probably they will not grow rapidly after that what is interesting is even if the tumor is slow growing or doesn't grow at all it can still lead to hearing loss that's why if you detect acoustic neuroma in younger individual probably it's best to go ahead with treatment rather than observation however if you detect in elderly patient then you can do observation in the younger patients there is risk of hearing deterioration anyway whether the tumor grows fast or not so probably surgery would be an option So when do you operate? If there are large tumor that is causing mass effect, raised intracranial pressure, brain stem compression, obviously you have to remove the tumor. They are steadily growing on serial MRI and there is functional uh, preservation desire, desire to preserve hearing, then you can do uh, hearing preservation surgeries. So the goal of surgery is the maximal resection with preservation of function. It is not a malignant tumor, so there is no need to remove everything but as much as possible should be removed because the recurrence depends upon how much tumor is left behind. So the critical factor for surgical outcome are tumor size, its extension and the features. What is the perioperative function such as the hearing status and the facial nerve uh, status and the surgical experience of the operating surgeon. These factors determine the surgical outcome of the patient. So usually in surgery, we do retrosigmoid, translabyrinthine, or the medial fossa approach. Sometimes they are used in combination. Usually, microscope is used to operate, and sometimes people seek the assistance of endoscope to visualize the internal structure inside. Thus, the commonest approaches are middle cranial fossa approach, translabyrinthine approach, sub-occipital or um, retrosigmoid approach, or combination of these approaches are used in order to resect the acoustic neuroma. So, what is the advantage of the retrosigmoid? There's good exposure for the cisternal component of the tumor. So, they are good for even large size tumor. There is hearing preservation in most of the time. This advantage is the headache that is associated with it and cerebellar retraction. In the middle fossa approach, small intracanalicular tumor are approached by middle fossa approach. Hearing is preserved in this surgery. And uh, the problem is, you know, uh, you have to retract the, uh, retract the temporal lobe and sometimes it leads to epilepsy. Also, the facial nerve comes early in middle fossa approach. There is more risk of facial palsy in the middle fossa because of the manipulation. And there are, of course, uh, post-operative complications associated with any surgical intervention. trans approach, uh, it is exposed in the Trotman's triangle bounded by sigmoid sinus, the jugular bulb, and the superior petrosal sinus. Tumor up to 2.5 centimeter can be dealt with by translabyrinthine approach. The problem is the auditory function is gone. You cannot preserve the hearing with translabyrinthine approach. So that is the risk. The biggest advantage is you identify the facial nerve early and the facial nerve preservation is excellent in the translabyrinthine approach. So it gives an excellent exposure of the lateral end of the IAC. So, if the tumor are very large, more than 2.5 cm, sub-occipital or retrosigmoid approach is done. If they are less than 2 cm, if you want to preserve the hearing, you can do middle fossa or sub-occipital approach. But if hearing is already non-serviceable, then you can go with translabyrinthine approach.
with trans labyrinth and approach these days even large size tumor are also handled so if the hearing is poor sometimes it's better to go with the trans labyrinth and approach again the outcome of the surgery depends upon the uh, preoperative function of the nerves so the hearing nerve and the facial nerve the surgical experience of the surgeon and the tumor factors such as the size of the tumor and the location of the tumor so how to improve the surgical outcome you have to use neuro monitoring so that the, uh, the nerves are not paralyzed such as the facial nerve monitor and the vasculature is the most important you shouldn't disturb the vasculature less manipulation less use of a cautery near the nerve are important parameters but sometimes we do conservative managements such as the observation or the stereotactics radiotherapy and uh, when there is like for example advanced age or patient has poor general health uh, short life expectancy uh, such as they already have some other uh, cancer or something then probably conservative management would be a better option here the goal is control the tumor growth it is not a curative intent so the stereotactic uh, radio surgery uh, involves gamma knife uh, linear accelerator and the cyber knife the radio static surgery differs from the conventional uh, radio therapy here you give a focus beam only to the tumor to prevent the uh, side effects a rigid stereotactic frame is used in order to uh, give the stereotactic radiotherapy it differs from conventional radiotherapy that you give a single high dose radiation here compared to multiple fractionated dose in the conventional radiotherapy there you give like the 32 fractions or 35 fractions of radiotherapy here you give a single 1 to 2 high dose of radiation advantage is because you don't undergo big surgery the hospitalization is less and you tend to recover more and it is good for elderly and medically unfit patients however it may not be desirable for the younger patients because uh, there is some degree of malignant transformation and this younger patient if the tumor recurs later on or gives some pressure symptoms then you want to do surgery at that time there's a lot of scarring and it makes the surgical very difficult and you have to do a long term follow up uh, if you don't operate because you are just uh, controlling the growth so for some selected uh, candidates radiotherapy may be a good option but for younger patients and if they are medically fit it's always better to go with surgery so the radio surgery or the radio uh, stereotactic radiotherapy what it does is there is low morbidity because you don't operate and then the long term control rate is quite good so this can be considered if this is the only hearing ear then probably that may be an option it has some uh, i mean uh, complication associated with the radiation although it is not as much as the uh, conventional radiotherapy if it is associated with uh, neurofibromatosis bifepsizumab um, is an um, is a good uh, chemotherapy used to deter the tumor growth and it also preserves uh, functional uh, hearing to some extent but uh, chemotherapy is only used when it is associated with neurofibromatosis too otherwise it's not very effective if there there is you know um, peritumoral inflammatory response to reduce the symptom sometime ansets are used uh, in elderly patients for example you don't want to operate to reduce the inflammatory and uh, inflammation around the tumor and reduce the symptoms so 
whether to give surgery just to observe serially or stereotactic uh, uh, radiation or uh, chemo in neurofibrosis type 2 all depends upon multiple factors small intracranial cooler you can observe if it is like up to 2.5 you can do translabyrinthine if herring is already gone any size tumor you can do translabyrinthine if the tumor are very very big with large external component genes then sub occipital retro segment approach may be a good idea what if it's only herring or ear then you may do either serial observation or give uh, radiotherapy as a treatment of choice or after the surgery you can do cochlear implantation or brain stent implantation if it's only hearing ear so once you do remove the tumor sometimes patient will end up with facial paralysis some will end up with hearing impairment some will end up with lower cranial palsies some will end up with headache some will go into depression and cogn cognitive impairment so rehabilitation after the radio i mean uh, echo neuroma surgery is very very important so we will uh, learn in brief about how to manage each of these complications of acoustic neuroma surgery so if there is facial paralysis we can grade it by the house brackman scoring and uh, we already know about the house brackman score if it is just grade 1 grade 2 then we can just do care of the eye or use artificial tears or lubricants face uh, eye shielding or sometime you can use tarsography and platinum or gold plates in order to close the eye these are less invasive interventions however if the patient is young and you want to give some kind of uh, before that if the patient facial nerve was intact after the surgery but if it get develop weakness way after one to two weeks sometimes it can be because of reactivation of herpes zoster there you have to treat with antiviral and steroids and the outcome is very very good but if the facial nerve is already gone and the patient is young then here you can do a facial augmentation and reanimation surgeries such as the dynamic procedures and the static procedures in order to uh, gain the facial symmetry and the function so the facial uh, reanimation surgery you have to see the time of paralysis some you give as much as uh, you know uh, one year time for it to recover then you have to also see whether there was transaction of the facial nerve or not what is the likelihood of recovery from the uh, paralysis so the dynamic procedures such as the primary nerve repair nerve grafting neuromuscular pedicle transfer etc are done and the static procedure are just to maintain basically make a symmetry uh, such as the gold weight lower lid correction uh, pull pull up operations etc hypoglossal facial anastomosis is, a, is an option it helps in closure of the eye and maintaining symmetry at the cost of tongue movement sometimes people do uh, nerve muscle graft the result is very fast but uh, it you have to transfer the nerve along with the muscle so these are some of the static procedure for paralyzed eyelids so the tarsography gold or platinum plating you can also do facial slings in order to give some cosmetic correction that was about the facial paralysis what if the hair hearing is gone if the hearing is gone then what you can do is simultaneous cochlear implant with acoustic neuroma removal is known as the siren surgery so if the it is non-serviceable hearing before you start the surgery you can already plan for siren but during the surgery 
if that cochlear knob is gone, then you cannot do cochlear implantation. So that time you have to plan for brainstem impl implant. So if it's non-serviceable hearing and the nerve is intact, cochlear nerve, then you can do with siren. But if there is a serviceable hearing, then probably you don't have to do a cochlear implantation. Then uh, you have to preserve the cochlear nerve as much as possible during the surgery. So this is the summary of the hearing. Even if you don't do any intervention, if, even if there's no growth, hearing will reduce. So younger patient is better to operate. The, if you want to preserve the hearing, you have to do middle fossa or the retrosigmoid. If tumor is big and the hearing is already non-serviceable, you can do translabyrinthine approach. If there is neurofibromatosis type 2 or is non-serviceable hearing, or the cochlear nerve is gone during the surgery, then brainstem implant is an option. The problem is it is not as good as the cochlear implant and sometimes you can only perceive the environmental noise, environmental sound and you can develop the speech. During surgery, if the lower cranial nerves are also gone, then extensive physiotherapy and psychosocial counseling is important in order to improve the quality of life of the patient. So to learn a brief about the surgical steps, uh, most vestibular sonoma originate in the IAC and they extend to the cerebropontine angle. So translabyrinthine approach is very good if the hearing is gone, is non-serviceable already, or there is no way that you can preserve the hearing, probably translabyrinthine approach is very good. So these are the steps involved. Do a cortical mastectomy, labyrinthectomy, skeletalization of the jugular bulb and the facial nerve, skeletonization of the internal auditory meatus. Then you can identify the facial nerve, open the posterior fossa, dura, rumble of the tumor, and then the closure with thine sac closure. After the operation, the whole uh, you have already open up the dura, you don't want to get infection inside, so blind sac closure has to be done. So you obliterate the middle ear cavity with the muscles uh, and fascia and then do a blind sac closure. Fat, the problem of using fat in the obliteration is when you do MRI to rule out recurrence, sometimes, you know, uh, it's difficult to make out whether it's fat or the tumor regrowth. So some people, they don't like to use the fat. And also the fat gets absorbed much faster than the muscle and the fascia. So when you are doing labyrinthectomy, you have to always keep in mind that the ampulla of the posterior canal is very near to the second genera of the facial nerve. The lateral semicircular canal is intimately related to the facial nerve. The ampulla of the superior semicircular canal is a landmark for the superior vestibular nerve. So once labyrinthectomy is done, then you have to skeletonize the whole of facial nerve. Ample irrigation has to be used in order to remove the bone dust and reduce thermal damage. Jugular bulb is the lower limit of the bone removal. That's why you have to go as far as the jugular bulb. The whole bone from the sigmoid sinus to the jugular bulb to the posterior wall to the dura, whole bone should be removed and then the labyrinthectomy has to be done. The internal artery canal is next to the vestibule, is medial to the vestibule. So when you open up, you have to do... Um, open up parallel to the uh, important uh, nerves. Transverse crest divides the superior vestibular nerve from the inferior vestibular nerve. <clears throat> uh, 
the internal artery meatus, almost 270 degree bone removal has to be done in order to remove the tumor safely. Because it's a closed bony wall, in order to gain the maximum access, maximum bone removal should be performed as much as possible. Transverse crates When you are doing trans labyrinthine approach, because the nerve originates from the superior and inferior vestibular nerve, so these are the structures to be seen first. When you are operating, surgeon sees the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve first. Then medial to the superior vestibular nerve is the facial nerve. Medial to the inferior vestibular nerve is the cochlear nerve. So they are deeper structures when you are operating. More superficial is the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve. So the tumor lies between your cochlear and the facial nerve on one side and surgeon on the other side. So between the facial nerve and the surgeon is the tumor because these tumors are in the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve. When you are removing the tumor, it is a good idea to develop tumor and get more access. So as you remove in piecemeal, you get better access and you can see better. If you try to remove the whole thing at one go, there may be too much of manipulation and the small blood vessel supplying the nerve may be damaged and this leads to nerve, uh, you know, nerve dysfunction post-operatively. Also, you have to be careful using bipolar near the nerve because if the blood supply goes, then or uh, the, by the thermal damage the directly the nerve is involved then uh, you know the facial nerve will be damaged if you remove in piecemeal it is always easier to manipulate the tumor and remove as much as possible maximum safe removal is the goal of the surgery not to remove everything if you think that it's adherent to the nerve Close to the nerve, sometimes it's better to leave that part alone. It's a benign tumor anyway. After the surgery, you have to obliterate the cavity and do a blind sac closer. That was about the trans labyrinthine approach. And some people, they do a middle fossa approach. You don't have to know in detail. It's usually done by the neurosurgeons. But... Uh, middle fossa approach is good if the tumor is uh, in the uh, there is small tumor in the internal artery canal and you want to preserve the hearing so is a hearing preservation surgery disadvantages you have to retract the temporal lobe and sometimes it leads to epilepsy This is the summary of the steps involved in the middle fossa. Retrosigmoid, uh, the thing is you get post-operative headache. They are good for tumor which are in the cisternal, uh, cister more of big cisternal tumors. It has um, post-op complication associated with these. And these are the advantages and disadvantages of the